my favorite stories is Larry, is, uh, Larry and Gail Miller. Gail was driving down the street with Larry and said, Larry, what are you laughing about? What are you smiling about? And he said, I love business. You know what? I know Larry Miller. Larry Bill Miller, I don't know, billion dollar industry. We're about seven, about seventy million dollar industry. We, our distribution is uh, pretty much worldwide. While the tree is an eighty year old company in the air freshener business, we are just a nine million, nine year old uh, business in the air freshener industry itself. Uh, however, this last year we became number one in selling over the tree at Walmart, Target, and, and all major mass merchants. Automotive, we still have a ways to go. We hope to surpass them in about a year. Um, the, uh, what I hope to accomplish today, in addition to, uh, uh, I'm actually about two months ago, uh, made an intrapreneur, which we'll be talking quite a bit about here, a the CEO of my company. And I just recently uh, went to uh, appointed myself as uh, executive chairman of Handstands. I want to tell you a little bit about the business story, but I want to do it in the context of I hope it's entertaining. I think you'll find the story quite unusual, quite a little classic ADD uh, entrepreneur. Uh, matter of fact, I enjoy going. I lecture. I, I, I've taught and worked here at the UVU as well at BYU in the entrepreneurial program. Here I'm currently entrepreneur in residence. And in case I forget, uh, one of the things that I enjoy doing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and I'm not sure if our brochures made it, if not, then drop by the entrepreneurial office and you can make an appointment with me. I'm here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. One of the things I get the greatest joy of is meeting with students individually about their business opportunities. And there's a lot of, of uh, pitfalls and mistakes I've made and somehow still made it in business, as you'll hear in my story. Yet, um, but I come back to teach to try to get to the uh, opportunity where we can avoid, help you to avoid some of those mistakes. One of the classic mistakes that, uh, you, that students make is setting up their partnerships. I'm not talking about the legalities of sole proprietor or sub S or LLC. I'm talking about well-meaning friends saying, let's get together and start this business. They start a great enterprise, and before I know it, one of them says, I always told you I was going to law school, and yet I don't want to give up any ownership. So there's things that we can solve and talk about as we go through. Also, as a little groundwork or basis uh, from business standpoint, I, uh, most of you are, um, how many of you are actually, your major is entrepreneurship? Okay, good, not very many. Uh, I'm one, though I'm entrepreneur in evidence, though I'm an entrepreneur, I'm really a businessman. And when people come to me and they say, gosh, I'm in accounting or I'm in marketing uh, or different finance, I say terrific. Take some entrepreneurial courses, but I love it if you graduate in one of those other disciplines, uh, as opposed to just entrepreneurship. Now, I don't have the entrepreneurship professors here in the department here, I don't think, or I'd be fired. Uh, I don't make any money doing this, so that's okay with me. But uh, I'm here to make a difference, so I teach what I believe. And what I believe is it'll be very difficult to get out of college and to start a business. Some of you already have a business. That's terrific. I'm here to help you. Some of you will find, after, like I tell my kids, Get a good education. Learn all you can. Go out in the real world and get a real job. And then watch for your opportunity to build a business. But that isn't my story. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. Oh, one more thing before I go. Again, ADD to the max. It just comes with the, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are just uh, playing ADD. I tell the students at BYU where I went to college, I said, you know, I could never get into BYU with my, with my uh, current, uh, with, with my grades if I would have had them today, as well as my ACT course, uh, uh, scores. So, um, but I look at them and there's about as many as this in the group and they're feeling pretty good about themselves and pretty good about their IQs and they're about their scholastic ability and they should be. And I say, you guys are smarter than I was. 
Matter of fact, I can remember my dad had a, a worked for IBM and had a doctorate degree of educational psychology. A wonderful man, just died a year or two ago. Great, great father. They get ticked off only on rare occasions, and it had to do with my scholastic ability. My uh, schoolwork uh, wasn't up to par. I had an older brother who passed the accounting exam first time, photographic memory. I, my IQ, as a matter of fact, in eighth, seventh grade, my dad had me sent to the principal's office to take an IQ test. I went in there, took the test. They had me do a bunch of stuff, which I didn't know what they were doing. My dad, usually when I take the grades home, he would get really angered at that time. And he'd get upset. And uh, so he had this test done. When I went home that night, my dad wasn't mad. He was just sad because the IQ test showed that I wasn't very bright. And here he was trying to get me to get such good grades, and I just didn't have the ability. So I tell the BYU students that story, and then I tell them this, but I'll beat you in business every time. Ooh, that go, what now? I don't get that. Well, through this process, you're going to learn that we all have gifts and talents. And uh, entrepreneurs sometimes are very gifted intellectually, as we'll talk about someone that's the new CEO. Mine, I'm really good, and there ought to be a place for this in an IQ test. I don't know that there is. I'm a pretty good strategist. I'm pretty good at passion. I'm pretty good at being obsessive on something. So when you look at yourself in business, look at the gifts. Don't look just at your weaknesses. Look at your gifts of what you've been given and see where you can measure up and add to the team and to the business and excel in your particular area. Now in business, it's my philosophy that it's like a business is, would be like a three-legged stool. Okay, and so if you're up there on that stool with a business that's successful and you're all raising high fives, that's because your stool has three founding principles. Particularly, I'm referring to, when I say three, to a startup. And you'll see what I mean. But first of all, we have to have a wow product. You know, I'll get people in the business who will come and go, wow, look at this product. And I'll look at it and go, wow, that is cool. And I can tell in their surveys and their uh, focus groups, it is a wow. And I go, that's awesome. You're one third of the way there. What do you mean? Well, that other leg is the team, the winning team. Most investors that invest in a business, they'll invest in a team of people even more than the product. They both better be right at the top. But they'll invest even more than find greater importance in the team. Now, what makes up the team of business? What are the particularly, I think, those four components to a business? What are they? What, what key elements? What gifted individuals do you need to have? How about sales? Unbelievable important sales. That's the one customer is king in business. The salesperson is the one that refers back to the business how we need to adjust or adapt. My air freshener business, as I'll talk to you in a minute, is built upon one question to a key buyer at Walmart and then listening and then running back to the company. And we all taking and listening what that buyer said. So sales and marketing, one of the four areas of that one leg of the team. What might be another one? Legal, uh, uh, very, very important. It wasn't one of my top ones. I, I always have legal. I spend about 200000 a year with legal attorneys and different things. Finance, Finance. huge, huge component. Uh, I recommend each of you do quickly in your own personal life. You may say, like, uh, uh, and rightly so, it's too much tedious work for our, my size and my uh, budget that the students on. Get used to doing it. Business is just an elaboration of that. So finance, sales, sorry about the <coughs> feedback. Uh, sales, what else? Well, the team at the company. So we've got finance, we have sales, okay, and I'm going to marketing with sales if you don't mind. Operations, <laughs> make it the block and tackling, okay? If we, don't, if we have the best products in the world, do you like the gift you were given today? Yeah. Okay, well, it'd be nice and patient with me if I screw up. Uh, okay, is it a bit of a while? 
I think there's some of you that will use that air freshener. It didn't cost that much in the store at Walmart. I don't know, three fifty or something. In a month, it'll be gone, the air freshener. But it's such a wild product, I'll bet many of you will keep it up there, uh, or at least your wives will. Uh, so it's a pretty much a, 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 a wild product. But if we didn't ship on time, if we didn't do all the things that Walmart required, and by the people, why I hear people say, we, we hate Walmart. I had $20 million a year with Walmart. Uh, we love Walmart. We just know what their guidelines are, and we have to produce, because that's why they produce some of the best, at their store, best products, often branded at the best price. Well, operations, and then the fourth one is ongoing product development. So that product's got to stay hot. Okay, so as we talk, think of those parameters and then think of different other words that watch in my story that you'll, uh, that I hope you capitalize on are strategy, strategy, passion, focus. Um, of course, I like to believe integrity for long term business. Um, angles, not new inventions. Angles, not new inventions. Uh, that's why I teach a lot of entrepreneurship so I, uh, classes. I say, oh, you spend, if you're really an uh, inventor, that's a businessman is really an entrepreneurship that sees a wow product and knows how to get it to the customer. Well, let's tell you some, uh, where's the clock? There's not a, I'll just have to rely on you, okay? Okay, but I'm going to rip through some stories pretty fast, if it's okay. Uh, as a student at Brigham Young University, I was having a bit of a hard time. Uh, focusing on my classes, which I hope is not the case for you. I really do hope you learn the principles. Most of the books I read about business, I think, make a lot of sense. Uh, I think it's good stuff. Um, yeah, but I was just having a little trouble focusing, and so I went out and started a real estate construction company in Provo Hills. I built it up to be a big business where at the age of about 28, 29, I built a big home in Alpine, put three mortgages on it because, and had a big boat behind it, I built this home in the, uh, about 1980 because, uh, and the reason I put three mortgages on it is because I thought it was worth about a million dollars and I wanted to put all that money into a development in Bountiful called Sunset Hollow, right at the south end of Bountiful uh, Golf Course. Anybody familiar with Sunset Hollow? Okay, pretty big concrete wall as you go in. Well, we paid half down for that subdivision, that valley. And uh, but man, the infrastructure to put in that subdivision was massive. That, that entry road just killed us. And uh, and then, but anyway, we were going to make a ton of money. My dad said, "Son, I'm proud of you. You're a good husband. You're a good father. You're a good. Uh, you go. You know, you teach your Sunday school class well, whatever. But you have too much debt." I go, "Oh, Dad, you're coming out of the '40s. You came from the Depression. We're never going to have those times again." And uh, so all of a sudden, within about a year, interest rates went to 22%. All real estate stopped just at the time we got our development all in and owed about six, seven hundred thousand dollars on a, on a variable loan that would vary, so it went up to 23, 24%. Had a couple of doctors that were partners, but after a while they just said, forget it. Uh, the only one that made money on that deal was my father, who ended up buying a little piece that said, I don't want any leverage, I don't want any debt. And dad came out about four years later making a very good profit. Anyway, but I all but went bankrupt. Uh, I, I didn't go find bankruptcy, but I owed about $20,000 after I all was said and done. And so I, uh, geez, I have a pretty incredible wife. Uh, and I went to her and I said, I'm, I'm pretty much an optimist, real unrealistic optimist. And I went to her and I said, you know what, it looks like you did marry a loser. And uh, I started what I call stinking thinking. And so I did that for about three days, stinking thinking. And uh, but my wife came to me and she goes, Don, it wasn't your fault. It really, half of it was my fault. It really was. I didn't need to be a millionaire at age 30. I needed to run a good business and there would have been ways to be more sound in that process. Uh, so I did make mistakes. But at the end, same, same token, interest rates went to 22%. And, you know, I didn't cause that. So a wonderful wife said, hey, you'll be fine. I'm not worried about you. As we move out of a, in 1981 or 83, a $350,000 home that we were so blessed to sell. Because I had a first, a second, and a third to my dad at $30,000 to 5%, which I paid him. And by the way, I'm grateful, even though Dad had the money, could have maybe bailed me out and said, hey, that's the way it goes. I'm so grateful he didn't bail me out. 
and I gratefully accepted the uh, money with interest. I'm not really sure, I can't remember if I really paid any interest. Uh, uh, but anyway, so we moved out of this house, we moved in a lousy little rental. And in that master bedroom, I, the day people had cats, and it smelled of cat urine. So we moved out of a big, beautiful home in Alpine. Not a big home, 30 years, 40 years, uh, how many years ago was that? Uh, 40 or 30? 1983. Uh, see, see, I just want to show you a dumb thing. So I just want to make that really evident, as you'll see throughout the process. This is very, and this will be very motivating you for to say, he built that business? Hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, we moved out, and my wife was great. And anyway, I need to show you another picture here. Uh, can you, I don't know if it's, uh, let's see, it's this one right here. So in 1983, uh, Buddy and I, uh, that served LDS missions together in Alaska, he was a successful uh, AT&T salesperson, came and he said, I want to start a business with you. You go with me. Long story short, we, sh we came up with the idea, actually through someone taking advantage of us and kind of screwing us candidly. Uh, we got into the dust cover business in 1983. One of the team things we'll teach in business, particularly entrepreneurship, is you want to start in a business in its infancy, when the industry is in its infancy. Why? So we don't have so much competition. Well, in 1983, I didn't know the PC computer was going to explode. And so, but we still, we, we got into that and I did understand sales and marketing. I did understand about listening to the customer and so we found out these dust covers. What we did is before he left his job, I was back just selling real estate for a friend because I had lost my business. But what we did is we tested the product. We took these, these vinyl dust covers and we took them to an Apple store. And we had about 30 made, it didn't take a huge investment. And uh, we had them made and packaged and we gave them to the Apple store. I think there's three different Apple stores. We gave them the Apple store and said, hey, these are for free. Really difficult math. It cost us $2 we knew in volume to make it. We would sell it to them. Uh, no, cost, I, I can't remember exactly. I think it was a dollar to make. Now the bigger vinyl covers that went over the Apple IIe and things were like $2 to make. We sold it to the stores for $4. They would sell it for $8. We went to him and said, hey, it's free. Will you take it? Why would I say it's free? I wanted to test. I wanted to start a new business, but I didn't want to start it if it isn't going to sell. It's really profound, but that's all it is. So we gave the, the covers to them. We went back two or three weeks later. They were all sold. We went back, and we go, hey, this looks like a winner. Looks like we've got something here. How do we sell to all these stores? Back then, there was just computer lands, business lands thousands of small little dealers starting up. No, no major, uh, uh, Walmart would sell the Atari and the Commodore and the uh, Texas Instruments, but no PCs, no, none of Apple's products. And so we, we went back and I said, hey, well, I guess uh, there's uh, stores that want it, the stores in Utah's like it. So Gary, you're an operations guy, you're a real detail guy, I'm not. Uh, I don't like the details. I'm a sales and marketing guy. I like finance, actually. I like budgeting, and I've always done that. So I'll do that. Gary, you're incredible at operations, and you'll get this product made. So that was our team. We hired one secretary, and we started a business. Now, to sell them, I went and said, Gary, I know. Well, he goes, how are we going to start to sell? I said, I know. You know what? My wife's been bummed. She's, she's been a great sport. We've moved out of this beautiful home. We're in a lousy little rental that stinks. And uh, I went home to my lovely wife and said, hey, Peg, you were right. You married a winner. How would you? The winners around here are terrible. That, no offense, but that was when Geneva was cooking, and the fog in the winter was unbelievable, smog and fog. Uh, I said, hey, what if we take the four of the seven kids we have now, what if we loaded them up in a motor home? Now we don't have a Mercedes anymore. You can't tell in that picture. That's a little tiny Subaru. We'll take our little Subaru and we'll take off in the western United States and we'll start out in Arizona in February and we'll go there. We'll pull behind a church where my uncle's a bishop. We'll set up the motor home. You teach the kids in the morning. Let them take their big wheels out in the church parking lot. I'll unhook the little Subaru in the daytime and I'll go door to door to computer stores. And what do you think she said? Awesome! She's perfect entrepreneurial wife. She said, that sounds perfect. So we took off. That is 
the actual picture of the first night halfway to Arizona, well, not halfway, but partway there in Paint Ridge, Utah. That, and we pulled off the side, a big storm came in, and fired up that generator, it's a brand new motor home, 350 bucks a month I could handle, and we started, uh, that was our first night. Then we went out to Western United States and settling dust covers. By the time uh, I got up to the Bay Area where I grew up, Los Alamos, Palo Alto area, my partner called me from Utah, and he goes, I've been out measuring dust covers, and I've noticed a little pad that sits underneath what they call a mouse. Well, the first company ever to develop a mouse map was a company called Mouse Tracks out of San Francisco. Uh, in the Bay Area, it makes sense. Well, they developed this mouse map, and uh, luckily didn't get a utility patent on it. And we go, wow. And by the way, I love capitalism. If you have pat if you can't patent something, I love it. It's free enterprise, and, and all men and women, free game to go after it. And so we went and said, hey, mouse pads, how hard could this be? Remember my, our, remember my IQ, our R&D isn't that good. So we go, hmm, mouse pads, how can we make mouse pads? We thought of a material that we boat every year at Lake Powell. Kind of reminds you of Scooby here, doesn't it? A little bit. So we found out a company that made uh, rolls of material back Grondike back east. And they shipped it out to us. We didn't have a lot of money for capital expenditures to buy a $100,000 clicker machine to die cut out these mats. So we went to Belter Steel Rule. They gave us a great price. They started cutting them out. And we today, I never dreamed that the mouse map would still be going crazy today. We are by far the largest producer in the world of mouse maps. We've made thousands of different types of mouse maps. Um, anywhere, well, every type you can. I'm not really proud, candidly, of the mouse maps. Some that are sold today, Walmart. Uh, we sell, if you look behind any of the mouse mats at Walmart, it'll say handstands, a little blue, a uh, little red insignia called handstands. Uh, that's our product. Most Best Buy, most all that mouse mats, you know, come from, the major ones come from our industry. We probably sold 70, 80, maybe 100 million mouse mats over those years. We thought it last five years. We then got into other computer accessories uh, and cases for iPods and different things. Um, about uh, how much time? What do we got? Uh, another 20 minutes. Okay, great. Um, one of the things that uh, in business, uh, let me tell you a failure. I like to throw in some failures or mistakes I made. One of the things we did is when we became very successful after about 10 years of business, maybe about 12, 15 million dollars in sales and making really good money, uh, bought a, built a new home that wasn't as big as the other one, but had a nice farm in Alpine and pay cash for everything. Uh, no more leveraging for me. Um, waited, bought the land, waited till I could build a home, and just did things far more uh, cautiously, and, and hopefully learned from your lessons. I, you know what, if my employees, one came to me not that long ago and said, uh, looks like I made a $70,000 mistake. So I brought in a couple of other people, and they said, okay, okay, let's go through it, okay. Who clearly, in our company would have known not to make that mistake. Nobody rose their hand. I said, great, that's great. No problem, because I don't want you to be afraid to go forward and to try things. And, uh, uh, but don't ever make that same mistake again. Well, in my, in my business, that's what I'm about. I don't care, if, I don't have a problem if our employees make mistakes. Uh, you know, judicious mistakes, but then learn from it. Well, here's a mistake I made. We would become quite successful in business, and uh, this, it wasn't a bad thing that I decided to spend some more time in charities or in other you know, activities uh, rather than at work. I kind of hired some good salespeople, and I lost a little bit of that eye of the tiger and thought, oh, what else can I do to make a difference? And that's it. I hope, I enter I hope it's entertaining, but I hope when you go out of here today, it, something I've said will make a difference. Well. As we lost a little bit of the eye of the tiger and didn't have our salesmen on that our strategists or really good listeners on the front line, we had a situation in which our biggest company of ours, we were probably, like I said, 10, 12, 15 million dollars and uh, doing very well, but a big company called Fellows, huge company. They, used to, they came from the paper, uh, uh, the uh, box, baker box industry, you know what those are. But uh, they had the shreds. At, Staples and Office Max. They were at the time about a $600 million company. 
And they came and wanted to buy us, and we couldn't work out the deal. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. You know, when you're young, you go, oh, sell, great, sell, great. You know what? I'm not one who's all about selling. Yeah, the dot com area, great. If you can hurry and make a couple million dollars off an idea, that was a bubble that we all knew wouldn't last. And we were glad that the students got over that. So they could get back to the reality of making a profit. And that's how you, how you build a successful business. Well, uh, as we lost a little bit of the eye of the tiger, Fellows Corporation did a brilliant thing. Even though we're all a big corporation, this is a lesson for you if you're an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, <coughs> that's someone that goes in and works in the business, but comes up with angles and passions, all the things that the entrepreneur did. I was an entrepreneur to start the business, but once you start it, then you're an entrepreneur or you're a good businessman. Well, we, uh, they, they, Fellows, hired some graduate students, they graduated from Illinois or somewhere back there, brought them in and said, this small company beats us in mouse mats and in this industry. We don't want to be beat anymore. We'll set you up as a satellite. You spend your time, your passion, your energy in beating that little company. Where, because all the customers loved us best because we were just passionate about what we did. And no one else had that much passion for, for mouse mats. Well, these guys looked at the industry. This would have been about 1994 or 5, I guess. Uh, these young people came up with a great idea that leapfrogged us in the industry for a number of years. They sat around the table, and they thought, and they brainstormed, and they brainstormed, and they thought, and they go, you know what? And what they did, all they did was take an angle off of some other industries. And that was, they were the first ones to say, why don't we put licensed products, brands, on mouse mats? We never thought about it. I wasn't losing sleep going, what's my next angle? We come up with some really cool mouse mats. I mean, our mouse mats are really nice. Like Joe wrist wraps and all sorts of NFL licenses and things. But they came up with the idea to get a license, and then they went to Disney. And said, Disney, how would you like to, how about if we pay you a 12% royalty and we put the Disney char characters on mouse mats? Well, all those stores that we had a tight relationship with said, we're so sorry. But customer is what? King. Customer is the king. Wish we learned that politically. I did quite well in politics for one short period that I wanted to make a difference. And I did something really profound public servant. We worked in Alpine as servants of the public. No, isn't it? You know, uh, I, anyway, won't get off on that. Uh, my family, I'll, I'll, I'll add this little shot. I'm one of the few families, uh, I grew up in California, but my parents grew up in, uh, in uh, Brigham City, and Dad was a strong Democrat. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm in business. I'm no strong Democrat. <laughs> I'm in for business creating jobs. My business since we've been offered quite a few times to sell the company. No way. No way. I employ a lot of people. And these people are awesome. And, and other than, I think there are some tax problems. But I'm happy or unhappy, whatever way you want to look at it, to report that I pay 40% tax. Most, you know, if, if, you know, some of these guys, like Warren Buffett, ticks me off. Because Warren pays about 16. I don't blame him for only paying 16. But when you're happy, if I sold my company, I'd be like them. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I'd be like them. I'd be investing in companies, and I'd get capital gains to treatment. But most small businesses have to pay their LLC or sub S have to pay straight income, whether you get it or not. I try to always have no debt. I'll try to rein in this little part of it. I try to have no debt. Last year, because I hired an entrepreneur, not last year, about 10 years ago, which I'll move to that story now, he has created so much growth with his air freshener business that I, that opposes debt and buys 40% to the government for taxes, and then, the left of the rest of the money for growth to provide more jobs and more opportunities, I couldn't, with the 16% less, I had to borrow $5 million last year. 
to handle the growth. Anyway, that's a little uh, extra day on that. About one of the things I love to do, what goes around comes around. I love to talk to young people about business. I talked to a young person, uh, how much time do we have? Um, about another uh, five minutes. Okay, this will be really quick. I would buy, uh, I have a farm out in Alpine, and I'd go and I love to buy tractors. And I would go buy a tractor uh, about 20 years ago from a young man named Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson was uh, putting himself through Westminster College. He, different than I, very much an, an entrepreneur, uh, much better than I, a CEO, an executive, and he's now my CEO. But as a young person, he was uh, selling tractors or lawnmowers to get through school at Westminster. His IQ is 108. He has a photographic memory. He's the only person that we know of that's gotten a perfect 4.0 at Westminster College in economics. He's also the best salesman I've ever met. But anyway, he would sell me tractors. As a matter of fact, today I have two big college tractors. Why I need two, I don't know, but he's good. And um, <laughs> so anyway, for 10 years, every time I'd come in, he'd see my expectations, customer gain. When he got through with that, every time he'd go, Mike, if we go out in the backyard and I brainstorm with you, mentored, mentoring all the time, constantly. Can I ask you this, this, this? Finally came to me at one point and said, Don, I have the opportunity to go to Stanford and get an MBA. Uh, should I do that or should we, would you go into business with me? I said, I cannot answer that question for you. That's a very big question. I don't have your answers for that. Uh, he goes, uh, I'm thinking, but you'll go in business with me. I said, sure. You're a winner. I'll come in business with you. Remember, probably winner, a team for most of us as our investors is bigger than the product. I knew he'd figure out the product. Well, we wanted to buy that uh, tractor store, and we couldn't come together on the price. He came to me and said, well, I'll come to work for your company. I go, no, 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 let's watch for a different opportunity. Uh, he goes, Don, you have a sticky pad, a patented product that sticks on your dash. No adhesive, no magnet, it sticks there. And uh, that's only in your electronic distribution, your uh, electronic stores. Uh, um, where mouse mats and things are sold, cell phones are sold. Why isn't that in the automotive industry? I said, because automotive stores carry, four, have 400 different, uh, different suppliers, and they're not about to carry one SKU, even though they like it. He goes, I'll tell you what, pay me a good salary for one year, and then I'll go straight commission, and I'll get it in everywhere. He got it in everywhere. Everywhere where we couldn't, myself and the veterans of 15 years in the industry couldn't get it. He got it in everywhere. We were sitting at a trade show, in Las Vegas, after one year of him working for me, and he goes, well done, I've got it in everywhere, but um, uh, we cut, need to come up with a new product. And you have taught me, Don, that um, so we're about there. Okay, so he had, um, I had told him, you know, selling tractors or selling houses, one time done, it's over. I said, I love being in Lake Powell. I'm out there. Uh, having a great time at Lake Powell, and I just know there's thousands of stores selling my products, and I'm making money right then. <laughs> now, I don't want to forget that also one of the things I did that was good when I lost the Irish Tiger, I became chairman of the Utah chapter of Operation Smile, where we, where we doctors give their time and nurses give their time to go and operate on kids with club lab pals. So I did good things, but, but didn't make sure my company, Line Fellows, had some young people working there. Well, Chris Anderson. Long story short, came and he says, rather than doing tractors, rather than doing mouse maps, how about a, how about a, a, a consumable product, like air fresheners? And uh, I said, no, nope, no, nope. I teach the students that's in the tour industry. The tree owns it, and then there's 10 other companies that have it. Shell Oil Company has it. No, nope, no. Nope. He goes, Don, please, we've got the most innovative people in the world at our company. We can come up with a new air fresher. We came up with a new one. It's called the Bug. We got it at Walmart. The buyer said, wow. As the buyer said, good, and that will ride in, what, a couple of months? He said, yes. Chris did this, and this built a $50 million industry in the last seven years, soon to be, by other things, hopefully a $100 million company. He stopped. He asked the buyer this question. Are you unsatisfied with anything in the air freshener business with all these other accounts? He said, come back in here. I've been telling the major companies that air fresheners come from the automotive industries, males, for males 15 to 25 years of age. I've been telling you that 70% of my buyers at Walmart are who? Female. Why don't you make female-oriented air fresheners? He said, thanks, Mont Lotsia. Sells them don't talk a lot, the good ones. 
They listen and they react. He came back, he told me the story, I got it in a second. My IQ and some things isn't so great. I caught that. I gave him every resource he wanted. And we built to this day, if you went to Walmart, there are 109 SKUs of different air fresheners. We have the most. We have 52. Refresh your car, Bahama, and now we've finally come back and gone against the tree with their black eyes back to the mill oriented with Driven. And so, pretty fun story, but it's really Chris Anderson, you know, if it means anything, uh, really at our funerals, it won't be people coming to say how much we made. It'll be how much we gave. But he's a millionaire. He's very well to do. He's sure he has ownership in my company because he's at the top of the top. He's passionate, he has integrity, he focuses, and he's very, very loyal and creative. Thanks, good to be with you. Uh, now, I don't know if there's any more time for questions. Yes, we've got about three minutes for questions. Oh, okay, great. We've got quite a bit of time. Better ask some questions or I'm going to be depressed. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you said that after you worked with Disney to get the uh, licensed characters on the mouse pad, that the retail outlets didn't like it? We didn't Why? get the Disney. Oh, you Remember, know. Fellows, thank you for asking that question. Fellows corporations that have the $600 million company, they hired students like you, came, brought them in, and said, go beat that little company in Utah making mouse nets. They sat around for a couple months. They came up with a marketing strategy to put licenses on mouse nets. So that's what that was. Yes, sir.
He's 6'4", big Arizona guy, played baseball for BYU. Anyway, he's standing by me. The meeting's over. This beautiful Peggy Tuttle slows down the steps, gets to here, I hurry and sit down. I reacted within a second. Why did I sit down? I'm short. She's taller than me. I got to go take a little strategy here. So I sit back down. She flows on by. I'm going, oh my gosh. I say to Norm, did you see her? He goes, no, I don't know. You know? And so anyway, my roommate says, oh, that's Peggy Tuttle. I'm going over there for lunch. I go, great. He goes over there for lunch, comes back two hours. I go, hey, what? Did she, did she say anything about me? <laughs> no, but she had a lot of questions about your cousin. That's sad. Anyway, got him on a mission. I sealed the deal. <laughs> sealed the deal. Anyway, within two couple more weeks of getting married, um, I, got, I got a good job up to BYU. Uh, I get a job. I look on there. It's a garbage man. I go, I like that. So I got a job as a garbage man at Brigham Young University on the garbage truck. I like it because I like being outside. I don't like it. I cannot stand out. Oh, good thing I have a microphone. I cannot stand it. I just can't do it. I did pretty good for not being all over this place. Uh, so anyway, I go, I go to her grandma's house, grandma says, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing? She go to work? I go, yeah, I'm a you know, sanitation engineer. She goes, what? I go, a garbage man. She goes, you got to be kidding me. Now, that was a little embellishment, but pretty close. So I go back and I go, honey, I want to be, I, I want to be a doctor, but I'm not smart enough. I want to be a hospital administrator. I'm a businessman. I like people. I'm passionate. Okay, great. Honey, whatever. That's fine. So I was trying to, so I went down network to Utah Valley Hospital, Mark Howard, the administrator, said, hey, uh, tell me about hospital administration, that's for me. Hey, how do I get a job here? He goes, hey, go down to HR. I race down to HR, I go in, the lady goes, what would you like? I go, I want a job here. She goes, I want a job here, what can you do? I go, well, what can I do? She goes, the only thing you can do is an orderly. I go, great, I'll be an orderly. She goes, no, there's eight orderly positions. They're all handled by pre-med students at Brigham Young University, so they can get to medical school. And there's a hundred of them that are on the application. So how are you going to get a job? Well, she didn't say that. That's what I figured out. So rather than stinking thinking, like a lot of some of you, I go home and what do I do for three days and nights? What do I do? Obsess. Strategize. Come up with an angle. Because that's how I succeed in business, because I'm not that smart. I got to think when no one else is thinking, when they're sleeping. So I walk into the hospital three days later, and I walk up to the pink ladies. They go, hi, ladies. They go, oh, hi, you're cute little guy. I go, um, I want to be a pink lady. They go, oh, that's cute. That's really cute. I go, no, I'm serious. I want to be a, I want to, what can I do? And they go, well, you can deliver the flowers to the patients. I go, perfect. So on the third day of delivering flowers to Mrs. Butler in the operating room, she came out of the operating room and she said, uh, what is it you're doing here? And I said, I'm delivering flowers. She goes, no, I mean, what are you doing? I go, I'm passionate. I'm hardworking. I have a positive attitude, and I want to be a hospital administrator, and I'm going to volunteer here until someone hires me. She goes, you're hired. I worked for a year and a half there, well, before I started my real estate. So have some creativity. Have some passion. Business is awesome. Thank you very much.